Hi, I'm Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress, and it is my pleasure to wish you a very happy Children's Book Week. This year marks its 100th anniversary, and the Library of Congress is excited to join the celebration. We are especially excited about the 2019 theme, Read Now, Read Forever, because it looks to the past, present, and the future of children's books, and our celebration aims to do the same. Today, the Library of Congress is launching a new digital collection of children's book selections. This new collection is made up of full-color, digitized versions of dozens of specially selected children's books from our general and rare book collections. Our hope is that these books will be enjoyed equally by children, their parents, and teachers. We've organized the collection into three main categories, learning to read, reading to learn, and reading for fun. To help us connect young readers of today with these historic children's books, we've teamed up with the voices of contemporary creators of children's literature. Local authors who are members of the Children's Book Guild of Washington, D.C. will be reading 20 of these special books to you right here from the Young Reader Center in the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress, starting right now and continuing for the next few hours. As you listen, do keep in mind that every one of these stories that we have selected existed when the first Children's Book Week was celebrated 100 years ago. So get comfortable and put your listening ears on. Here we go. Good morning. Happy Children's Book Week. I'm Leanne Potter, and I direct the Office of Learning and Innovation here at the Library of Congress, and I get the pleasure of reading our first story. The book I have for us is entitled The Juvenile National Calendar. It was published in 1824, and it is a much more interesting book than its title might imply. It actually has a subtitle. It was not just The Juvenile National Calendar. It was called The Juvenile National Calendar, or a familiar description of the U.S. government. With hand-colored illustrations and amusing verses, it describes the role of the people, of the president, the vice president, the cabinet members, and congressmen in 1824, when the United States was less than 50 years old. It engages young citizens and teaches them about the workings of their government. And it begins, the rising generation. Come all my young pupils, stand round in a ring, and listen to me while I merrily sing. I will tell you of those who enjoy the command, which is held o'er all of us, for the good of the land. Of the president, cabinet, congressman too, I mean to describe and bring into view, who by learning and virtue their honors did get, so that you, if you're good, may be presidents yet, the people. But first of the people, my song must relate that they choose for themselves who shall govern the state. And each of the men who are aged 21 has a right to cry out what he wants to be done and meet with his neighbors, some friends to elect, to rule over the land and whom all may respect. And he for whom most of the people may shout is placed as a ruler until his turns out. President of the US. Of the president next, you will hear me declare that although neither silver nor gold does he wear, and like you may be punished if he e'er acts wrong, yet to him does much power and importance belong. He ambassadors sends to the nations afar he is chief of the soldiers who fight in the war. He may pardon the convict of hanging in fear, and he gets $25,000 a year, the vice president. Next to him, the vice president ranks in the land with one-fifth of the pay and a smaller command. As chief of the Senate, of right he presides, and his vote, when the others are equal, decides. If the president dies, sir, his place he must take until the good people another can make. 
Their stations they hold for a term of four years, after which, as a citizen, each one appears. The Secretary of State. But the President chooses a council for aid, before which the affairs of importance are laid. The first has an eye or all matters of state, and on him all the foreign ambassadors wait. The Turk and the Dutchman and Russian so gain bow down to the floor in the presence of him. And $6,000 is what we must give to enable this one of the council to live. Secretary of the Treasury. The task of the next is to watch o'er the gold and the keys of the chests which enclose it to hold, to keep an account how the money all went, and to tell the good people how much they have spent. And by turning and twisting his thoughts in his brain, to hit on a method to get more gain. And to pay for this trouble in guarding our store, we give him the same as the others before. Secretary of the Navy. The next or the Navy, that boast of our land, or its sailors and officers holds its command. He tells to what regions the vessels must sail, or bids them repose in the port from the gale. He signs the commissions which office to bestow on those who on ocean must vanquish the foe. Though he rules on the sea, yet lives on the shore, and receives what we gave the others before the Secretary of War. Or the army, the next of the council presides, for its wants and its comforts, tis he that provides. When war is declared, he gives orders to march to the soldiers well stiffened with buckram and starch. And forward they rush at the word of command to bleed or die for the good of the land. The lawyer for all, we must add to this yet, and now we've completed the whole cabinet going to Congress. The congressman next our attention demands. Some are chosen for merit and some for their lands. As the people can't meet altogether, you know, they choose from their body some few that shall go. And he who is anxious to help make laws works hardest and longest for public applause. Till chosen, he bids them a gracious goodbye and the pleasure of going is bright in his eye the member of Congress. Next in Congress, as we hear his speeches declaim, give honor to one, to another give blame. Demand what he thinks is of use to his friends with a candor and freedom that never offends. As long as he can, he is willing to stay, for he gets for his trouble $8 a day. And when all his toil and labor is over, contented returns to his station before. And finally, General Lafayette. Thus far I have sung of our country and laws, but still there's another who claims your applause, whose blood for our freedom once freely did flow, who at Yorktown and Brandywine vanquished the foe, and returns when the summer of manhood is gone to the homage of hearts which are wholly his own. His name? You shall hear it and never forget the friend of America, brave Lafayette. Thank you. Happy Children's Book Week.
Walter Crane illustrates these timeless fables and morals credited to Aesop, a Greek storyteller who lived in the 5th century BCE. Originally, the fables were not written down, but only spoken aloud. The fables and their lessons continued to be interpreted anew by illustrators and storytellers in each generation. In Baby's Own Aesop, Walter Crane condenses each of 56 fables to brief and entertaining rhymes with the attendant morals and illustrates them in his vibrant style. Notice his mark in each illustration, a large C surrounding a W and a stick figure crane. Baby's Own Aesop. Being the fables condensed in rhyme, with portable morals pictorially pointed by Walter Crane. And those of you who are poetry fans will notice that these morals, uh, these fables are written in limerick form. The cock and the pearl. A rooster, while scratching for grain, found a pearl. He just paused to explain that a jewel's no good to a fowl wanting food, and then kicked it aside with disdain. And the moral is, if he ask bread, will ye give him a stone? The wolf and the lamb. A wolf, wanting lamb for his dinner, growled out, Lamb, you wronged me, you sinner. Bleated lamb, nay, not true, answered wolf. Then twas you, you or lamb, you will serve for my dinner. Fraud and violence have no scruples. The wind and the sun. The wind and the sun had a bet. The wayfarer's cloak, which should get? Blew the wind, the cloak clung. Shone the sun, the cloak flung. Showed the sun had the best of it yet. And the moral is, true strength is not bluster. King Log and King Stork. The frogs prayed to Jove for a king, not a log, but a livelier thing. Jove sent them a stork who did royal work, for he gobbled them up, did their king. And the moral is, very simply, don't have kings. The frightened lion. A bullfrog, according to rule, sat a croak in his usual pool, and he laughed in his heart as a lion did start in a fright from the brink like a fool. Imaginary fears are the worst. The mouse and the lion. A poor thing, the mouse. I'm starting this one over. The mouse and the lion. A poor thing the mouse was, and yet, when the lion got caught in a net, all his strength was no use. Twas the poor little mouse who nibbled him out of the net. Small causes may produce great results. And the next one is a big favorite here, the married mouse. So the mouse had a lion for bride. Very great was his joy and his pride. But it chanced that she put on her husband her foot, and the weight was too much, so he died. One may be too ambitious. And if you look closely at the illustration, poor little mouse is lying there, dead. The next one is Hercules and the Wagoner. When the gods saw the Wagoner kneel, crying, Hercules, lift me my wheel from the mud where tis stuck, he laughed, no such luck. Set your shoulder yourself to the wheel. The gods help those who help themselves. The lazy housemaids. Two maids killed the rooster, whose warning awoke them too soon every morning. But small were their gains, for their mistress took pains to rouse them herself without warning. And the moral is, laziness is its own punishment. The snake and the file. A snake in a fix tried a file for dinner. "'Tis not worth your while," said the steel. "'Don't mistake, I'm accustomed to take, "'to gives not the way of a file. "'We may meet our match." Said sly fox to the crow, Oop, I forgot the title on that one, let's go back. The fox and the crow. 
said Sly Fox to the crow with the cheese. Let me hear your sweet voice now, do please. And this crow being weak, cawed the bit from her beak. Music charms, said the fox, and here's cheese. Beware of flatterers. The dog in the manger. A cow sought a mouthful of hay, but a dog in the manger there lay, and he snapped out, how now? when most mildly the cow adventured a morsel to prey. Don't be selfish. The frog and the bull said the frog quite puffed up to the eyes. Was this bull about me as to size? Rather bigger, frog brother. Puff, puff, said the other. A frog is a bull if he tries. But brag is not always belief. The fox and the crane. You have heard how Sir Fox treated Crane with a soup plate in a plate. When again they dined, a long bottle just suited Crane's th throttle, and Sir Fox licked the outside in vain. There are games that two can play. Horse and Man When the horse first took man on his back to help him the stag to attack, how little his dread as the enemy fled, Man would make him his slave and his hack. Advantages may be dearly bought. The ass and the enemy. Get up, let us flee from the foe, said the man. But the ass said, why so? Will they double my load or my blows? Then by goad and by stirrup, I've no cause to go. Your reasons are not mine. The fox and the mosquitoes. Being plagued with mosquitoes one day, said old fox, pray don't send them away, for a hungrier swarm would work me more harm. I had rather the full ones should stay. And the moral of this one is, there were politicians in Aesop's time. The fox and the lion. The first time the fox had a sight of the lion, he most died of fright. When he next met his eye, Fox felt just a bit shy, but the next quite at ease and polite. Familiarity destroys fear. The miser and his gold. He buried his gold in a hole. One saw, and the treasure he stole. Said another, what matter? Don't raise such a clatter. You can still go and sit by the hole. Use alone gives value. The golden eggs. A golden egg won every day, that simpleton's goose used to lay. So he killed the poor thing, swifter fortune to bring, and dined off his fortune that day. Greed overreaches itself. And the last fable for now, the man that pleased none. Through the town, this good man and his son strove to ride as to please everyone. Self, son, or both tried, then the ass had a ride, while the world at their efforts poked fun. You cannot hope to please all. Don't try. Thanks, everybody. I'm excited to be with you for Children's Book Week. Uh, Read Now, Read Forever gives today's authors, like myself, a chance to celebrate classic books and stories that were meaningful to us as children and young readers. So happy Children's Book Week, and thanks. Good morning, my name is Michelle Y. Green. I'm the author of A Strong Right Arm, the story of Mamie Peanut Johnson, and a series, a historical fiction series called Billy Pearl. The Little Pretty Pocket Book was published in 1787. The caption under the frontispiece of this significant piece of early American children literature reads, Instruction with Delight. This title, probably more than any other, 
marks the point at which American children's literature turns from overwhelmingly instructional to being entertaining as well. In 1787, when this book was printed, society had very strict ideas of what should be entertaining for children, and even an invitation to play games was accompanied by morals and life lessons, as you will see in the games selected here. A little pretty pocketbook intended for the instruction and amusement of little Master Tommy and pretty Miss Polly, with two letters from Jack the Giant Killer. Here we go. The Great G Play. Hop, step, and jump. Hop short and step safe to make your jump long. This art oft has beat the efforts of the strong. And the moral is, this old maxim, take, embellish your book, think well ere you talk, and ere you leap. Look. The little G play. Boys and girls come out to play. After a sultry summer's day, when the moon shines and stars are gay, the nymphs and swains well-pleased advance and spend the evening in a dance. The rule of life, reflect today upon the last and freely own thy errors pass. The great H play. I sent a letter to my love. The lads and lassies here are seen, all gaily tripping o'er the green. But one among them, to her cost, the treasure of her heart was lost. The rule of life, if prosperous of pride beware, changes of fortune frequent are. The little H play. Pitch and hustle. Poise your hand fairly and pitch plumb your slat and shake for all heads and turn down the hat. The moral is, how fickle this game, so fortune or fate, decrees our repentance when off tis too late. The great I play, cricket. This lesson observe when you play at cricket, catch all fairly out or bowl down the wicket. And the moral is, this maxim regard, now you're in your prime, look ere tis too late. By the forelock, take time. The little eye play. Stool ball. The once ball once struck with ardent care and drove impetuous through the air. Swift round his course, the gamer flies, or his stool's taken by surprise. The rule of life. Bestow your alms whene'er you flee, an object in necessity. The great K play. Swimming. When the sunbeams have warmed the air, our youth to come, cool brook repair. In whole refreshing steams, streams they play to the last remnant of the day. The rule of life. Think ere you speak, for words once flown, once uttered, are no more your own. The little K play. Baseball. The ball once struck, off flies the boy, to the next destined plot, and then home with joy. The moral is, thus seamen for lucre fly over the main, but with pleasure transported return back again. The great L play, trap ball. Touch lightly the trap and strike low the ball, and none catch you out, and you'll beat them all. The moral is, learn hence, my dear boy, to avoid every share. Contrive to involve you in sorrow and care. The little I play. Tip cat. The gamer here his art displays and drives the cat a thousand ways. For should he miss, once tis tossed, he's out and his sport is lost. Rule of life. Debates and quarrels always shun. No one by peace was e'er undone. The great in play. Fives. With what great force this little ball rebounds when struck against the wall. See how intent each gamer stands. Mark well his eyes, his feet, his hands. The rule of life. Know this, which is enough to know. Virtue is happiness below. That's an excerpt from the Little Pretty Pocket Book. Do you believe in dreams? I do. When my mother was very young, her name is Willie Pearl, she lived in the faraway Misty Mountains in a little town called Jenkins, Kentucky. She had a teacher who would read to her every day from fairy tales. And one day, Willie Pearl, who came from a poor family with a lot of moral values, decided that she wanted to see the castles 
far, far away. Once upon a time, there was a little boy. His name was Frex, Eddie Lee Young. He was my father, and he lived in the Misty Mountains far away in Jenkins too, about a mile away from where my mother lived. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Michelle, and she lived with her mother and father, and she went to Germany. And in the fifth grade, she had a teacher, Miss Rowell, that used to talk to her every day and speak to her and read to the class about Little House on the Prairie. And Michelle grew up knowing that she wanted to be an author. And what do they all have in common? They all had dreams. Well, Willie Pearl and Eddie Lee Young got married. Uh, 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 my father went down to Tuskegee, and there he became a pilot, and I'm wearing his wings. The two of them got married, had three daughters. We moved to Germany. And believe it or not, Willie Pearl saw all the castles on the Rhine. She saw gondolas. She saw England. She saw all of Europe. And we had a wonderful time. The moral of our story is read. Read everything that you can. And if you can't read, find someone to read to you. It's the best adventure in all of the world. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here today. And happy Children's Book Week. Good morning. My name is Lulu de Nacre. I am the author illustrator of Olinguito de la Ala Z, Descubriendo el Bosque Nublado, Olinguito from A to Z, Unveiling the Cloud Forest. Today, I will be reading Little Red Riding Hood, published in 1863. It's a tale that is well known in many countries. Being from Puerto Rico, I know the Spanish version, Caperucita Roja. I always cheered when Caperucita escaped El Lobo Feroz. This 1863 retelling of Little Red Riding Hood is in verse. In, it's both a book and a paper doll being caught in the shape of Little Red herself with the wolf subdued at her feet. There was a lonely cabin within a dark old wood, and in it with her mother there dwelt Red Riding Hood. The tall old trees above them, their winter fire supplied, when autumn's flaming sunsets from their red leaves had died. The rippling brook their water from far off mountains brought, and prattled off their summits and in icy statues wrought. For them the squirrels hoarded their nuts in hollow trees, and pounds of sweetest honey were made by the bees. To gather these together was work enough to do. Little Red Riding Hood thought so, and no doubt would you. Blushing beneath her fingers, looked up the berries red. The flowers seemed to know her and listen for her tread. This little pot of butter I've churned so nice and sweet, and mind not stop and prattle with anyone you meet. Then through the shady forest the little maiden went, and though her steps were fleetest, the day was well nigh spent. When nearly through her journey, an old gaunt wolf she spied, who wagged his tail and humbly came walking by her side. Ah, said my little maiden, how fair you are. You really look quite handsome. Where do you walk so far? Forgetful of her mother, she stopped and told him where. <gasps> then she said, then said the wolf, 
so cunning. What is it that you bear? Forgetful of her mother, she stood and told him what? This butter for my grandma packed nicely in this pot. Then said the wolf, goodbye, dear. Perhaps we'll meet again. Then swiftly as he hastened, swiftly through dale and glen. And running reached before her, the cabin gray and old, her grandmama was absent, he quickly did unfold. Himself in cap and nightgown, then quickly on the bed. Closely upon the pillow, he laid his grisly head. Red Riding Hood soon entered. Oh, grandmama, see here, a little pot of butter. Where is my grandma, dear? Here, said the wolf, well feigning her grandma's voice so weak. I'm here so sick, my darling, that I can scarcely speak. Take off your clothes, my darling, upon the bed. Come lie, when you are here beside me, I'll be better by and by. Red Riding Hood obeyed her and got upon the bed. Oh, Grandmama, how altered you are, she quickly said. Oh, what great eyes, my Grandmama, they never looked so before. That's to see you better, my darling, the larger to see you more. What a great nose, my grandma. I never looked so before. That's to smell you better, my darling, the larger to smell you more. And what great hands, my grandma. They never looked so before. That's to hold you tight, my darling, and to hug you more and more. What a great mouth, my grandma, as large as your tin cup. That's to open wide, my beauty, and then to eat you up. Then he opened his great mouth wider to eat her like a bird. But at the dreadful moment, a hunter's gun was heard. The wolf fell dead and bleeding. Then Grandma hastened in, for she had seen the peril, her danger that had been. Red Riding Hood wept sadly and sorrowed more and more that she disobeyed her mother, which she never did before. And she thought with, her, with fear and trembling of the death that came so near. And she said the fright had taught her to mind her mother dear. Then listen, you old children, and mom your mother's mind your mother's word, for the great wolf, men call evil, is prowling worn, is prowling round on her. Today we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of Children's Book Week. We celebrate enduring books and new books. For me, enduring books bring us the comfort of familiarity with themes that speak to us through the ages. And new books bring the excitement of the discovery of worlds and feelings not known before. Today, new books also bring the power of representation. When the reader sees that the hero of a story mirrors her appearance, and life experiences, the child feels empowered and included. Muchas gracias y sigue leyendo.
name is Karen Deans. I am the author of Swing Sisters, the story of the international sweethearts of rhythm. Today I'm going to be reading The Cat's Party, which was published in 1871. McLaughlin Brothers was a New York publishing firm in the second half of the 19th century and a pioneer in color printing for children. Their books are often retellings of tales and amusing stories in inexpensive formats. In The Cat's Party, some very well-dressed and polite cats get invited to a party that doesn't go all too well. The Cat's Party. Mrs. Grimalkin writes her cards. Meek Mistress Grimalkin, so fat and so hearty, once gave to her kittens a nice little party. She sent out her cards with gilt edges bound for the tortoiseshells, tabbies, and blacks to come round. There was uncle and aunt and some cats of first water, of course not forgetting her last married daughter. There was mother and sister besides her first cousin. Counting heads as they sat, they made up a dozen. Mrs. G determines to borrow her mistress's dishes. The next thing to be done was to make preparation. So the kittens were called to hold consultation. Quoth Mrs. G, I've determined from mistress to borrow all the dishes we need and return them tomorrow. We'll have crumpets and muffins and nice buttered toast, shrimps and fried fish, and some meat which we'll roast. There's nothing like fish, though we're plenty beside. I could eat a large plateful, especially fried. The table groans and Tom runs away. The day was quite fine, the weather propitious. So they spread out the things which appeared so delicious. They had so much on the table that a tomcat declared, it certainly groaned and he ran away scared. The guests now arriving, they each took a seat, some suspiciously eyeing the fish and the meat. It having been hinted, twas not all quite fresh. They each begun thinking they were caught in a mesh. They are desired to make themselves at home. Mrs. Evans was dressed in her best bib and tucker. This quarrelsome cat often got in a pucker. And though Tom was handsome, he'd much cause to wail, being hurt by the door to on his tail. But all went on smoothly, for each did their best to do all they could to please all the rest. And they made themselves happy as good kittens ought, though of all the nice things, not one had been bought. Mrs. G's marked politeness to her old friend Thomas. Then Madame Grimalkin, though oft she did roam, said, I hope you with all make yourselves quite at home. As mistress do don't look very close to her store, there is plenty of everything. Tom, take some more. Yes, dear Miss Grimalkin, now look at this dish and permit me to send you a piece of fried fish. I thank you, dear Tom, if your appetite's keen, Here's a cup of the very best milk ever seen. Billy and the Bellows. Such politeness from old and young feline shoots has seldom been seen since the famed Puss in Boots. But Billy, who wore a great brown shining coat, got a dreadful large herringbone stuck in his throat. Then he kicked and meowed with all force he was able and finally turned upside down the great table when his friend Mrs. Evans, of him being jealous, coolly thrust down his throat the nose of the bellows. The dance. Such roughness, such kindness, at length moved the bone, and poor Billy recovered himself very soon, when a ladylike cat, who had visited France, after supper proposed they should all have a dance. Tom and her ladyship now opened the ball, and merrily danced to the delight of them all. The others soon followed till all in the room were dancing away as though quite at home. Sudden appearance of Mrs. In the midst of the dancing, the mistress came in, completely astonished to hear such a din. She struck the ringleader, which so frightened the rest that to get out of sight, they each did their best. 
And the moral of the story is, a saying there is, perhaps not known to all, and to it the attention of every good cat I call. It's something about taking what isn't hisn. And the saying winds up with, he shall go to prison. So all cats and kittens from us take advice, and never still viands, though ever so nice. Leave your feelings be hurt by this candid illusion, and like Tom and the rest of them, put to confusion. Here's to a wonderful life of reading and storytelling. Happy Children's Book Week. And I am a children's book publisher here in Washington, D.C. at a very small children's book press called Tenley Circle Press. Today I'm going to be reading to you Yankee Doodle, an old song in a new dress by Howard Pyle, published in 1881. Howard Pyle offers a youngster's view of war, specifically the American Revolution, its troops, and ordnance, writing and illustrating at the same time as the three British masters Caldicott, Crane, and Greenaway, Pyle is known by many as the father of American children's book illustration. His talent for creating illustrations that go beyond the simple characterization of the story is on full view in this work. Yankee Doodle, an old song an old friend, in a new dress. Father and I went down to camp, along with Captain Goodwin, where we see the men and boys as thick as hasty pudding. There was Captain Washington upon a slapping stallion, a giving orders to his men, I guess there was a million. And then the feathers in his hat, they looked so tarnal fina. I wanted pescally to get to give to my Jemima. And then they had a swamp and gun as big as a log of maple on a deuced little cart, a load for father's cattle. And every time they fired it off, it took a horn of powder. It made a noise like father's gun, only a nation louder. I went as near it I went as near to it myself as Jacob's underpinning, and father went as near again. I thought the deuce was in him. Cousin Simon grew so bold, 
I thought he would have cooked. I, sorry. Cousin Simon grew so bold, I thought he would have cocked it. It scared me, so I shrinked off and hung, hung by father's pocket. And there I see a pumpkin shell as big as mother's basin. And every time they touched it off, they scampered like the nation. And there I see a little keg. Its heads were made of leather. They knocked upon it with little sticks to call the folks together. And then they'd fife away like fun and play on cornstalk fiddles. And some had ribbons red as blood all wound about their middles. The troopers, too, would gallop up and fire right in our faces. It scared me almost half to death to see them run such races. Old Uncle Sam come then to change some pancakes and some onions. Good fresh pancakes and inures for sale at one halfpenny apiece. For lasses cake to carry home to give his wife and young'uns. I see another snarl of men, a digging graves, they told me. So tarnal long, so tarnal deep, they tended they should hold me. It scared me so, I hooked it off, nor slept, as I remember, nor turned about till I got home, locked up in mother's chamber. The end. Happy Children's Book Week. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My life has been bookended by books and libraries. When I was about seven years old, I got my first job in this little town off the coast of Quincy, Massachusetts. The librarian, Edna Curtis, invited me to be her library page. My job was to go to the, the children's bookshelf, the lowest shelf, and put the books in alphabetical order. And also to take Ms. Curtis's ruler and make sure that all the books were one inch in from the edge of the shelf. That's what I did when I was seven or eight years old. And now I'm a children, children's book publisher at Tenley Circle Press, a very, very small children's press. And here I am today in the biggest and greatest library in the world, the Library of Congress. Thank you very much for letting me read to you. Good morning. My name is Amy Hansen. I'm going to be reading Baby's Own Aesop by Walter Crane, and it's published in 1887. Um, I'm the author of Firebird. For the Baby's Own Aesop, Walter Crane illustrated these timeless fables with morals credited to Aesop, a Greek storyteller who lived in the fifth century BCE. Originally, the fables were not written down, but only spoken aloud. The fables and their lessons continue to be interpreted anew by illustrators and storytellers in each generation. In Baby's Own Aesop, Walter Crane condenses each of the 56 fables to a brief and entertaining rhymes with the attendant morals and illustration, illustrates them in his own vibrant style. Notice his mark with each illustration, a large C surrounded by a W and a stick figure crane. This is part two of Baby's Own Aesop Selections that we are reading today. Pages. Two. 
the oak and the reeds. Giant oak in his strength and his scoth, scoth on the winds by, sorry, I'll try that again. Giant oak in his strength and his scoth of the winds by the roots was uptorn, but slim reed at his side the fierce gale did outride, since by bending the burden was borne. Moral is, bend not break. The fir and the brabble. The fir tree looked down on the brabble. Poor thing, only able to scrabble about on the ground. Just then an ax sound made the fir wish himself be a brabble. Pride of place has its disadvantage. The trees and the woodman. The trees ask the man what he lacks. One bit just to handle my ax. All he asks, well and good, but he cut down the wood. So well does he handle this ax. Give me an inch and I will take a mile, except it says an L. The heart and the vine. The heart and by the hunters pursued, safely hidden the vine till he chewed the sweet tender green and those shaking leaves seen, he was slain by his ingratitude. Spare your benefactors is the moral there. The man and the snake. In pity he brought the poor snake to be warmed at his fire. A mistake. For the ungrateful thing, wife and children would sting. I have known some as bad as the snake. Beware how you entertain traitors. Always good advice. The fox and the mask. The fox with his foot on the mask thus took the fair semblance to task. You're a real handsome face, but what part of your case and, and your brain is in, good sir? Let me ask. And I can't read them. Moral, <laughs> I'm sorry. The lion and the statue. On a statue, King Lion dis disthroned, showing conquered man, Lion frowned. If Lion, you know, had been sculptor, he'd show Lion rampant and man on the ground. The story depends on the storyteller. The booster, the boaster, sorry. In the house, in the market, in the streets, everywhere his boasting, his feats, till one said with a sneer, let us see it done here. What's so oft done with ease one repeats. The moral is deeds, not words. The vain jackdaw. Fine feathers, Jack thought, make fine fowls. I'll be envied by bats and by owls. But the peacock's proud eyes saw through his disguise, and Jack fled this assembly of fowls. Borrower, borrowed plumes are soon discovered, is the moral. The peacock's complaint. We're into peacocks right now, I can the peacock considered it wrong that he had not the nightingale's song. So to Juno he went, and she replied, Be content with thy having and, thy, and hold thy fool tongue. Do not quarrel with nature. Two crabs. So awkward, so shambling a gait, Mrs. Crab did her daughter berate, who rejoined, it is true, I am backward, but you needed lessons in walking quite late. Look at home. Two jars. Never fear, said the brass to the clay, of the two jars that flood bore away. Keep close to my side. But the porcelain replied, I'll be smashed if beside you I stay. Our friends are enemies. Brother and sister. Twin children, the girl she was plain. The brother was handsome and vain. 
Let him brag of his looks, father said. Mind your books. The best beauty is bred in the brain. Handsome is as handsome does. The fox without a tail. Said fox, minus a tail in a trap. My friends, here's a lucky mishap. Give your tails a short lease. But the foxes weren't geese, and none followed the fashion of trap. Yet some fashions have no better reason. The dog in his shadow. His image the dog did not know, or his bone in the pond's painted show. T'other dog, so he thought, has got more than he ought. So he snapped, and his dinner saw go. Greed is sometimes caught by its own bait. The crow in the pitcher. With cunning old crow got his drink. When twas low in the pitcher, just think. Don't say that he spilled it. With pebbles he filled it till the water rose up to the brink. Use your wits. I like that one. The eagle and the crow. The eagle flew off with a lamb. Then the crow thought to lift an old man. In his eaglish conceit, the wool tangled his feet, and the shepherd laid hold of the sham. Beware of overrating your own powers. The blind doe. A poor half-blind doe, her one eye kept shorewood all danger to spy as she fed by the sea. Poor innocent, she was shot from a boat passing by. Moral is, watch all sides. So thank you for letting me read. I'm very pleased to be here for Children's Book Week and pleased to be among all these extraordinary books. And I will be happy to come back next year. Thank you. Hello, I'm Karen Leggett Abouraya. I write nonfiction children's picture books. My current book is Malala Yousafzai, Warrior with Words. And since we're going to be reading from a, a book by an illustrator, I want to let you know that these books are illustrated by Susan L. Roth. And she does all her illustrations in cut paper collage. So she cuts lots of little tiny pieces of paper to do her collages. The man we're going to be looking, whose illustrations we're going to see today, Randolph Caldecott, worked with pen and ink and colors. And, and he was doing this, his energetic and often humorous illustrations, fill a collection of 16 picture books. And the Caldecott Award is named for him. This is the American Library Association's annual award to the artist of the most distinguished American picture book for children. And it's named for this beloved 19th century British illustrator. And this is a book of nursery rhymes and silly verses. And I want you to take a particularly close look at the children that he draws, because you'll get an idea of how children dressed in 1887 when this book was published. The first one we're going to read is one you might be familiar with, because it's a nursery rhyme we, we still tell sometimes in, in schools and at homes. Hey, diddle, diddle. Hey, diddle, diddle the cat, and the fiddle. And you see some of the pictures are in color. And look at the different, look at the characters in there because he's going to mention all of these characters. The cow jumped over the moon, and the little dog laughed to see such fun. And the dish ran away with the spoon. Now the next one we're going to read is a frog he would a wooing go. Now a wooing is a, is a phrase that everybody would have known in 1887. 
It really means that Frog is looking for a girlfriend. And, and you'll also see here, there are some phrases here that are, that are nonsense, but they're fun to listen to and they're fun to say, and I'm going to say them on every page. So by the end, you'll be able to say this funny phrase, and it'll get funnier and funnier the more you say it, especially if everybody starts saying it in the family. A frog he would a wooing go, hey ho, says Rowley, whether his mother would let him or no. With a Rowley, Powley, gammon, and spinach, hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. So off he set with his opera hat, hey ho, says Rowley, and on his way he met with a rat, with a Rowley, Powley, gammon, and spinach, Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Pray, Mr. Rat, will you go with me? Hey ho, says Rowley. Pretty Miss Mousy for us to see. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach? Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Now they soon arrived at Mousy's Hall. Hey ho, says Rowley. And gave a loud knock and gave a loud call. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach? Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Pray, Miss Mousy, are you within? Hey ho, says Rowley. Oh yes, kind sirs, I'm sitting to spin. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach. Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Pray, Miss Mouse, will you give us some beer? Hey ho, says Rowley, for Froggy and I are fond of good cheer. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach. Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Pray, Mr. Fogg, will you give us a song? Hey ho, says Rowley, but let it be something that's not very long. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach? Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Indeed, Miss Mouse, replied Mr. Frog. Hey ho, says Rowley. A cold has made me hoarse as a hog. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach? Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Since you have caught cold, Miss Mousy said. Hey ho, says Rowley. I'll sing you a song that I've just made. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach? Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. But while they were all thus merry-making, hey ho, says Rowley, a cat and her kittens came tumbling in with a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach. Hey, says Anthony Rowley. The cat, she seized the rat by the crown. Hey ho, says Rowley. The kittens, they pulled the little mouse down with a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach. Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. This put Mr. Frog in a terrible fright. Hey ho, says Rowley. He took up his hat and he wished them good night with a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach. Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. But as Froggy was crossing a silvery brook, hey ho, says Rowley, a lily white duck came and gobbled him up. Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. So there was an end of one, two, and three. Hey ho, says Rowley, the rat, the mouse, and the little froggy. With a Rowley, Powley, Gammon, and Spinach, hey ho says Anthony Rowley. So it's a funny verse without a very funny ending. But I wish you a happy Children's Book Week, and I hope you enjoy finding some old books, maybe with an aunt or a grandmother or somebody in your household has some beautiful old books around, and then enjoy all the new books that are being written and coming out every day, especially at your library. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Barbara Carney Coaston, the author of To the Copper Country, Mahala's Journey, 
a book published by Wayne State University Press. Today I will be reading part one of King Midas from Wonder Book for Boys and Girls by Nathaniel Hawthorne, published in 1893. In Nathaniel Hawthorne's A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys, with 60 designs by Walter Crane, Crane uses his powers of design and color to help Hawthorne retell six Greek myths for a young audience, including the stories of Medusa, King Midas and his Golden Touch, and Pandora's Box. He frames the telling inside a story of a young man telling tales to children at Tanglewood in Western Massachusetts. Today we will read about King Midas. Once upon a time, there lived a very rich man and a king besides, whose name was Midas, and he had a little daughter. King Midas was fonder of gold than of anything else in the world. If he loved anything better, it was the one little maiden who played so merrily around her father's footstool. But the more Midas loved his daughter, the more did he desire and seek for wealth. He thought that the best thing he could possibly do for this dear child would be to bequeath her the immensest pile of yellow glistening coin that had ever been heaped together since the world was made. Midas could scarcely bear to see or touch any object that was not gold. He made it his custom, therefore, to pass a large portion of every day in a dark and dreary apartment underground at the basement of his palace. It was here that he kept his wealth. Here, after carefully locking the door, he would take a bag of gold coin or a gold cup as big as a wash bowl or a heavy golden bar or a peck measure of gold dust and bring them from the obscure corners of the room into the one bright and narrow sunbeam that fell from the dungeon-like window. And then would he reckon over the coins in the bag, toss up the bar and catch it as it came down, sift the gold dust through his fingers and whisper to himself, O oh Midas, rich King Midas, what a happy man art thou. Midas was enjoying himself in his treasure room one day when looking suddenly up, what should he behold but a young man with a cheerful and ruddy face? He could not help fancying that the smile with which the stranger regarded him had a kind of golden radiance to it. As Midas knew that he had carefully turned the key in the lock and that no mortal strength could possibly break into his treasure room, he concluded that his visitor must be something more than mortal. You are a wealthy friend, man friend Midas, he observed. I have done pretty well, pretty well, answered Midas in a discontented tone. But if one could live a thousand years, he might have time to grow rich. What? exclaimed the stranger. Then you are not satisfied? Midas shook his head. And pray, what would satisfy you? asked the stranger. Midas paused and meditated. Raising his head, he looked the lustrous stranger in the face. Well, Midas, observed his visitor, tell me your wish. It is only this, replied Midas. I wish everything that I touch might be turned to gold. The stranger's smile grew so very broad that it seemed to fill the room like an outburst of the sun, gleaming into a shadowy dell. The golden touch, exclaimed he. You certainly deserve credit, friend Midas, for striking out so brilliant a conception, but you are quite sure that this will satisfy you? How could it fail, said Midas. I ask nothing else to render me perfectly happy. Be it as you wish then, replied the stranger, waving his hand in token of farewell. Tomorrow at sunrise, you will find yourself gifted with the golden touch. Day had hardly peeped over the hills when King Midas was broad awake. The golden touch had come to him with the first sunbeam. Midas started up and ran about the room, grasping at everything that had happened to be in his way. He seized one of the bedposts 
and it became immediately a fluted golden pillar. He hurriedly put on his clothes and was enraptured to see himself in a magnificent suit of gold cloth, which retained its flexibility and softness, although it burdened him a little with its weight. He drew out his handkerchief, which little Marigold had hemmed for him. That was likewise gold, with the dear child's neat and pretty stitches running all along the border in gold thread. Somehow or other, this last transformation did not quite please King Midas. He would rather that his little daughter's handiwork should have remained just the same as when she climbed his knee and put it into his hand. It is no great matter, nevertheless, said he to himself, very philosophically. We cannot expect any great good without its being accompanied with some small inconvenience. Wise King Midas emerged into the garden. Midas took great pains in going from bush to bush and exercised his magic touch until every individual flower and bud, and even the worms at the heart of some of them, were changed to gold. By the time this good work was completed, King Midas was summoned to breakfast. And as the morning air had given him an excellent appetite, he made haste back to the palace. Little Marigold had not yet made her appearance. It was not a great while before he heard her coming along the passageway, crying bitterly. This circumstance surprised him, because Marigold was one of the cheerfulest little people whom you would see in a summer's day, and hardly shed a thimbleful of tears in a twelvemonth. Marigold slowly and disconsolately opened the door, sobbing as if her heart would break. How now, my little lady? cried Midas. Pray, what is the matter with you this bright morning? Marigold held out her hand in which one of the roses which Midas had so recently transmuted. Beautiful, exclaimed her father. Ah, dear father, answered the child, it is not beautiful, but the ugliest flower that ever grew. As soon as I was dressed, I ran into the garden to gather some roses for you. But, oh, dear, dear me, such a misfortune. All the beautiful roses that smelled so sweetly and had so many lovely blushes are blighted and spoiled. They are grown quite yellow, as you can see this one, and have no longer any fragrance. What can have been the matter with them? Pray, don't cry about it, said Midas, who was ashamed to confess that he himself had wrought the change which so greatly afflicted her. Sit down and eat your bread and milk. You will find it easy enough to exchange a golden rose like that for an ordinary one which would wither in a day. I don't care for such roses as this, said Marigold, tossing it contemptuously away. It has no smell, and the hard petals prick my nose. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the story, which will be read by another reader. Hello, my name is Carl Brown. Um, I'm a co-author in uh, three books, one of which you see here, Humans of Blue. Um, I've got to be a co-author in these books through an organization called Shout Mouse Press. And today I'll be reading uh, The Wonder Book for Girls by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And this one is The Golden Touch, a story about King Midas. King Midas took one of the nice little trouts on his plate and touched its tail with his finger. To his horror, it was immediately transmuted from an admirably fried book trout into a goldfish. It was really a metallic fish and looked as if it, it had been 
cunningly made by the nicest goldsmith in the world. King Midas, just at that moment, would much rather have a real trout in his dish. I don't quite see, thought to himself, how I am to get any breakfast. Here was literally the richest breakfast that could be set for a king, and its very richness made it absolutely good for nothing. The poorest laborer, sitting down to his crust of bread and cup of water, was far better off than King Midas, whose delicate food was really worth its weight in, weight in gold. King Midas began to doubt whether, after all, riches are the one desirable thing in the world, or even the most desirable. Some, so fascinated was, my, was Midas with the glitter of the yellow metal that he would still have refused to give up the golden touch for so paltry a consideration as a breakfast. Nevertheless, so great was his hunger that he groaned aloud. Our pretty Marigold started from her chair and running to Midas threw her arms affectionately about his knees. He bent down and kissed her. My precious Marigold, cried he. But Marigold made no answer. Alas, what had he done? The moment the lips of Midas touched Marigold's forehead, a change had taken place. Little Marigold was a human child no longer, but a golden statue. Midas began to wring his hands and bemoan himself and to wish that he were the poorest man in the wide world. If the loss of, his, of all his wealth might bring back the, the faintest rose color to his dear child's face while he was in his tumult of despair, he suddenly beheld the same figure which had bestowed on him this disastrous faculty of the golden touch. The stranger's countenance still wore a smile, which seemed to shed a yellow lush, luster all about the room and gleamed on the little marigold's image. And on the other objects that had been transmuted by the touch of Midas. Well, friend Midas, said the stranger, pray how do you succeed with the golden touch? Midas shook his head. I am very miserable, said he. Very miserable indeed, exclaimed the stranger. Have you not anything that your heart desired? Gold is not everything, answered Midas, and I have lost all that my heart really cared for. Ah, so you have made a discovery since yesterday, observed the stranger. Which these two things do you think is really worth the most? The golden touch? or your own little marigold, warm, soft, and loving as she was an hour ago. Oh, my child, my dear child, cried poor Midas, wringing his hands. You are wiser than you were King Midas, said the stranger, looking seriously at him. Tell me now, do you sincerely desire to rid yourself of this golden touch? It is hateful to me, replied Midas. Go then, said the stranger, and plunge into the river that glides past the bottom of your garden. Take likewise a vase of the same water and sprinkle it over any object that you may desire to change back again from gold into his former sub substance. If you do this in, in earnestness and, sense and sincerity, it may possibly repair the mischief which your avarice has occasioned. Midas lost no time in snatching up a great earthen pitcher and hasting to the riverside. As he scampered along and forced his way through the shrubbery, it was positively marvelous to see, positively marvelous to see how the foul, foul, foliage turned yellow before him. 
as if the autumn had been there and nowhere else. On reaching the river's brink, he plunged headlong in, without waiting so much as to pull off his shoes. As he dipped the pitcher into the water, it gladdened, yeah, it gladdened his very heart to see it change from gold into the same good. Honest earthen vessel which it had been before he touched it. King Midas hastened back to the pallet, hasted back to the palace. The first thing he did was to sprinkle it by handfuls over the golden figure of little Marigold. No sooner did it fall on her than the rosy color came back to her dear his dear child's face. Mary Gold did not know what she had been a little golden statue, nor could she remember anything that had happened since the moment when she ran with outstretched arms to comfort poor King Midas. Her father led little Mary Gold into the garden where he sprinkled all the remainder of the water over the rose bushes and above five and above 5,000 roses recovered their beautiful bloom. Little Mary Gold's hair had now a golden, a golden tinge, uh, which he had never observed in it before, had been transmuted by the effect of his kiss. This change of hue was really an improvement and made Mary Gold's hair richer than in her babyhood. When King Midas had grown quite an old man and used to trout Mary Gold's children on his knee, he was fond of telling them this marvelous story, and then <clears throat> would he stroke their glossy ringlets and tell them that their hair likewise had a rich shade of gold, which they had inherited from their mother. And to tell you the truth, my precious little folks, quoth King Midas, delight delightingly um, trouting the children all the while, Ever since that morning, I had hated the very sight of all other gold, save this. That was the reading of uh, Golden Touch, um, a story of King Midas. And um, I think that children's, uh, children's Book Week is in, uh, important because it gives uh, young authors like myself the inspiration to create their own piece. Um, I'm delighted and honored and grateful uh, to have read this in front of you all um, in the Library of Congress and I hope to be back soon.
Hi, I'm Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress, and it is my pleasure to wish you a very happy Children's Book Week. This year marks its 100th anniversary, and the Library of Congress is excited to join the celebration. We are especially excited about the 2019 theme, Read Now, Read Forever, because it looks to the past, present, and the future of children's books, and our celebration aims to do the same. Today, the Library of Congress is launching a new digital collection of children's book selections. This new collection is made up of full color, digitized versions of dozens of specially selected children's books from our general and rare book collections. Our hope is that these books will be enjoyed equally by children, their parents, and teachers. We've organized the collection into three main categories, learning to read, reading to learn, and reading for fun. To help us connect young readers of today with these historic children's books, we've teamed up with the voices of contemporary creators of children's literature. Local authors who are members of the Children's Book Guild of Washington, D.C. will be reading 20 of these special books to you right here from the Young Reader Center in the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress, starting right now and continuing for the next few hours. As you listen, do keep in mind that every one of these stories that we have selected existed when the first Children's Book Week was celebrated 100 years ago. So get comfortable and put your listening ears on. Here we go. Hello, my name is Katherine Marsh. I am the author, most recently, of Nowhere Boy. And today I'm delighted to be reading Mother Goose in Hieroglyphics, which is not quite as old as you'd think with hieroglyphics since it was published in 1855. Mother Goose nursery rhymes have been enjoyed by children for centuries. One early claim to the author's actual identity had the rhyme starting with Dame Goose, printer Thomas Fleet's mother-in-law who loved to sing songs and tell stories to children. Mr. Fleet supposedly gathered the rhymes together and printed them in 1719. But no copy of that work has been found and that claim has been discounted with many others. Mother Goose remains a fictitious but no less beloved character today. This collection of 26 nursery rhymes was printed in 1855. It is a rebus, inviting the young reader to interpret the many pictures that replace nouns throughout the text. Mother Goose in Hieroglyphics. It is often said that folks nowadays are a deal wiser than their fathers and grandfathers, but I don't think so, for who has ever written books like Mother Goose, Mother Hubbard, and Mother What's-Her-Name that lived a great while ago. And books for children, too, little dears. How many of them owe their lives to the influence of their soothing songs and lullabies. The world would not have been half-peopled had not these old sages once lived and written their invaluable books for children. When the doctor sends for psychic for a nervous little chick, make a mistake and go to the booksellers and buy Mother Goose and hieroglyphics. That's what is wanted, a pretty book written with pictures as they wrote in Egypt a long while ago when folks knew something about the time when Mother Goose herself was a little gosling. Yes, buy one of these little books and when it is torn up, buy another and another till the wee ones are old enough to read Robinson Crusoe and the like. My word for it, there is nothing like books with pictures to keep children quiet. And this is the best that was ever written as everybody knows. Mother Goose and Hieroglyphics. Little Jack Horner sat in a corner eating a Christmas pie. He put in his 
thumb and pulled out a plum and said, oh, what a great boy am I. Pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to see the queen. Pussycat, pussycat, what did you there? I frightened a little mouse hiding under her chair. Ride a horse to Charing Cross to see a lady jump on a white horse with rings on her fingers and bells on her toes and she shall have music wherever she goes. hush a -by baby upon the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bough breaks, the cradle will fall. And down tumble cradle, baby and all. Hey, diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle. The cow jumped over the moon. The little dog laughed to see the sport and the dish ran away with the spoon. One, two, buckle my shoe. Three, four, shut the door. Five, six, pick up sticks. Seven, eight, hang the gate. Nine, ten, a good fat hen. Eleven, twelve, ring the bell. Thirteen, fourteen, draw the curtain. Fifteen, sixteen, go to meeting. Seventeen, eighteen, to hear the preaching. Nineteen, twenty, that's a plenty. Little boy blue, come blow your horn. The sheep are in the meadows the cows and the corn. Is this the way you mind your sheep? Under the haystack, fast asleep? Tom, Tom, the piper's son, stole a pig and away he run. The pig was eat and Tom was beat and Tom ran crying down the street. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe she had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread. She whipped them all soundly and put them to bed. Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye, four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. When the pie was opened, the birds began to sing. And wasn't this a dainty dish to set before the king? The king was in the parlor, counting out his money. The queen was in the kitchen, eating bread and honey. The maid was in the garden, hanging out the clothes. There along came a blackbird and nipped off her nose. Ba ba black sheep, have you any wool? Yes, Mary, have I, three bags full. One for my master and one for my dame and one for the little boy that lives in the lane. So I want to thank you for joining me today, and I wanted to say a brief word about Children's Book Week, which I feel so fortunate to celebrate here at the Young Readers Center of the Library of Congress. This year, the uh, center is celebrating enduring children's books, as well as new ones. And when I write books for children, I want to make sure that I'm writing for the children of today and also the children of tomorrow. And I think all children's book writers hope that their books will live on in the hearts of children and in the hearts of grown-ups who have children always inside them, their childhood selves. So thank you very much for joining me today. I'm Catherine Marsh.
Sandra Strickland. Um, today I'll be reading to you Kate Greenaway's A Apple Pie book. Kate Greenaway's ABC book teaches the alphabet as she tells the story of eating an apple pie. Her illustrations here of happy, well-fed, and scrubbed clean children are good examples of idealization of childhood. A Apple Pie by Kate Greenaway. A Apple Pie. B Bit It. C Cut It. D Dealt It. E Eat It. F Fought For It. G Got It. H had it, J jumped for it, K knelt for it, L longed for it, M mourned for it, N nodded for it, O opened it, P peeped in it, Q quartered it, R ran for it, S sang for it, T took it, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z all had a large slice and went off to bed. <laughs> the end. Now, if I were illustrating this book, we wouldn't have any fighting. There would also be a party at some point where everyone gets to share the pie. <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed today's reading of Kate Greenaway's A Apple Pie. Once again, I'm Shadra Strickland. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Debbie Levy. I'm the author of 25 books for young people, including I Dissent, Ruth Bader Ginsburg Makes Her Mark, and my latest book, This Promise of Change, with co-author Joanne Boyce, cover art by the superb Echoa Holmes. Today I will be reading Humpty Dumpty by W.W. W. Denslow, published in 1903. W.W. W. Denslow most famous for his illustrations of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum, writes and illustrates this book about the son of Humpty Dumpty, who frets over his fragile state and wants to avoid his father's fate. He takes the advice of a wise hen, asks the farmer's wife for help, and turns his future into one of resilience and fearlessness. Without further ado, Denslow's Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty was a smooth, round little chap with a winning smile and a great golden heart in his broad breast. Only one thing troubled Humpty, and that was that he might fall and crack his thin white skin. He wished to be hard all the way through, for he felt his heart wobble when he walked or ran about, so off he went to the black hen for advice. This hen was kind and wise, so she was just the one for him to go to with his trouble. Your father, old Humpty, said the hen, was very foolish and would take warning from no one. You know what the poet said of him? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put Humpty together again. 
So you see, he came to a very bad end just because he was reckless and would not take a hint from anyone. He was much worse than a scrambled egg. The king, his horses, and his men did all they could for him, but his case was hopeless, said the hen, and shook her head sadly. What you must do, continued the hen, as she wiped a tear from her bright blue eye, is to go to the farmer's wife next door and tell her to put you in a pot of boiling hot water. Your skin is so hard and smooth, it will not hurt you. And when you come out, you may do as you wish. Nothing can break you. You can tumble about to your heart's content, and you will not break, nor even dent yourself. So Humpty rolled in next door and told the farmer's wife what he wanted, that he wanted to be put in boiling hot water as he was too brittle to be of any use to himself or to anyone else. Indeed you shall, said the farmer's wife. What is more, I shall wrap you up in a piece of spotted calico so that you will have a nice colored dress. You will come out looking as bright as an Easter egg. So she tied him up in a gay new rag and dropped him into the copper kettle of boiling water that was on the hearth. It was pretty hot for Humphrey at first, but he soon got used to it and was happy for he felt himself getting harder every minute. He did not have to stay in the water long before he was quite well done and as hard as a brick all the way through. So untying the rag, he jumped out of the kettle as tough and as bright as any hard boiled egg. The calico had marked him from head to foot with big bright red spots and he was gaudy as a circus clown and as nimble and merry as one. The farmer's wife shook with laughter to see the pranks of the little fellow for he frolicked and frisked about from table to chair and mantelpiece. He would fall from the shelf to the floor just to show how hard he was. And after thanking the good woman politely for the service she had done him, he walked out into the sunshine on the clothesline like a rope dancer to see the wide, wide world. Of the travels of Humpty Dumpty, much could be said. He went east, west, north, and south. He sailed the seas. He walked and rode on the land through all the countries of the earth, and all his life long he was happy and content. Sometimes as a clown in a circus, he would make fun for old and young. Again, as a wandering musician, he twanged the strings of his banjo and sung a merry song. And so on through all his travels, he would lighten the cares of others and make them forget their sorrows and fill every heart with joy. But wherever he went, in sunshine or rain, he never forgot to sing the praises of the wise black hen, nor the good kind farmer's wife who had started him in life, hardened against sorrow with a big heart in the right place for the cheer and comfort of others. I hope you liked this surprising and perhaps a little odd version of Humpty Dumpty. I did, you never know what you'll find in a book. I'm enjoying being here at the Library of Congress for Children's Book Week. The theme for this 100th anniversary is Read Now, Read Forever, which I love. Why do I love this theme? Because reading and books are things that we have for our entire lives, forever. We may change schools, we may change where we live, we may change our favorite foods, we may change our minds, but once we're reading, we've got that forever and that doesn't ever have to change. Again, I'm Debbie Levy and I hope you enjoyed Humpty Dumpty. I'm Leslie Long, and I'm going to read The Tale of Mrs. Tiggy Winkle by Beatrix Potter. Uh, Beatrix Potter had a lot of little animal friends um, that she liked to draw pictures of and write stories about. Um, and one of them was her little pet hedgehog, Mrs. Diggywinkle. My friend here is a hedgehog, right? And um, he's soft, but real hedgehogs are kind of prickly, um, so they can avoid being some bigger animal's lunch. 
In the story, there's a little girl named Lucy, and she's wearing a pinafore. She calls it her pinny. Um, that was a kind of a little apron, sort of a smock thing that little girls wore over their dresses to keep them clean when they played. Um, there's also a style, and a style is uh, a set of steps um, on either side of a stone fence or a wall so that it's easy to get from one side to the other. Um, let's read the tale of Mrs. Tiggywinkle, and we'll see the picture of the style and the picture of Lucy and her penny. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Lucy who lived at a farm called Little Town. She was a good little girl, only she was always losing her pocket handkerchiefs. One day, little Lucy came into the farmyard crying. Oh, she did cry so. I've lost my pocket hankin, three hankins and a penny. Have you seen them, Tabby Kitten? The kitten went on washing her white paws. So Lucy asked a speckled hen, Sally Henny Penny, have you found three pocket hankins? But the speckled hen ran into the barn clucking, I go barefoot, barefoot, barefoot. And then Lucy asked Cock Robin, sitting on a twig. Cock Robin looked sideways at Lucy with his bright black eye, and he flew over a stile and away. Lucy climbed upon the stile and looked up the hill behind Little Town, a hill that goes up, up into the clouds as though it had no top. And a great way up the hillside, she thought she saw some white things spread on the ground. Lucy scrambled up the hill as fast as her stout legs would carry her. She ran along a steep pathway up and up until Little Town was right away down below. She could have dropped a pebble down the chimney. Presently, she came to a spring bubbling out from the hillside. Someone had stood a tin can upon a stone to catch the water, but the water was already running over, for the can was no bigger than an egg cup. And where the sand upon the path was wet, there were footmarks of a very small person. Lucy ran on and on. The path ended under a big rock. The grass was short and green. And there were clothes props cut from bracken stems with lines of plaited rushes and a heap of tiny clothespins, but no pocket handkerchiefs. And there was something else, a door, straight into the hill, and inside it someone was singing. Lily white and clean, oh, with little frills between, oh, smooth and hot, red rusty spot, never here be seen, oh. Lucy knocked once, twice, and interrupted the song. A little frightened voice called out, who's that? Lucy opened the door, and what do you think there was inside the hill? A nice clean kitchen with a flagged floor and wooden beams, just like any other farm kitchen, only the ceiling was so low that Lucy's head nearly touched it, and the pots and pans were small. And so was everything there. There was a nice, hot, singy smell. And at the table, with an iron in her hand, stood a very stout, short person staring anxiously at Lucy. Her print gown was tucked up, and she was wearing a large apron over her striped petticoat. Her little black nose went sniffle, sniffle, snuffle, and her eyes went twinkle, twinkle, and underneath her cap, where Lucy had yellow curls, that little person had prickles. Who are you? said Lucy. Have you seen my pocket hankins? The little person made a bob curtsy. Oh, yes, if you please him. My name is Mrs. Tiggywinkle. Oh, yes, if you please him. I'm an excellent clear starcher and she took something out of the clothes basket and spread it on the ironing blanket. 
What's that thing, said Lucy? That's not my pocket hankin. Oh no, if you please em, that's a little scarlet waistcoat belonging to Cock Robin. And she ironed it and folded it and put it on one side. Then she took something else off the clothes horse. That isn't my penny, said Lucy. Oh no, if you please em, that's a damask tablecloth belonging to Jenny Wren. Look how it's stained with currant wine. It's very bad to wash, said Mrs. Tiggywinkle. Mrs. Tiggywinkle's nose went sniffle, sniffle, snuffle, and her eyes went twinkle, twinkle, and she fetched another hot iron from the fire. There's one of my pocket hankins, cried Lucy, and there's my penny. Mrs. Tiggywinkle ironed it and goffered it and shook out the frills. Oh, that is lovely, said Lucy. And what are those long yellow things with fingers like gloves? Oh, that's a pair of stockings belonging to Sally Hennypenny. Look how she's worn the heels out with scratching in the yard. She'll very go soon go barefoot, said Mrs. Tiggywinkle. Why, there's another handkersniff, but it isn't mine. It's red. Oh, no, if you please them. That one belongs to old Mrs. Rabbit, and it did so smell of onions. I've had to wash it separately. I can't get out the smell. There's another one of mine, said Lucy. What are those funny little white things? That's a pair of mittens belonging to Tabby Kitten. I only have to iron them. She washes them herself. There's my last pocket hankin, said Lucy. And what are you dipping into the basin of starch? They're little dicky shirt fronts belonging to Tom Titmouse. Most terrible particular. Now I finished my ironing. I'm going to air some clothes. What are these dear soft fluffy things, said Lucy. Oh, those are woolly coats belonging to the little lambs of Skelgill. Will their jackets take off, asked Lucy. Oh, yes, if you please them. Look at the sheep mark on the shoulder. And here's one marked for Gatesgarth, and three that come from Littletown. They're always marked at washing, said Mrs. Tiggywinkle. And she hung up all sorts and sizes of clothes, small brown coats of mice, and one velvety black moleskin waistcoat, and a red tail coat with no tail belonging to Squirrel Nutkin, and a very much shrunk blue jacket belonging to Peter Rabbit, and a petticoat not marked, that had gone lost in the washing, and at last the basket was empty. Then Mrs. Tiggywinkle made tea, a cup for herself and a cup for Lucy. They sat before the fire on a bench and looked sideways at one another. Mrs. Tiggywinkle's hand holding the teacup was very, very brown and very, very wrinkly with the soap suds. And all through her gown and her cap, there were hairpins sticking wrong end out so that Lucy didn't like to sit too near her. When they had finished tea, they tied up the clothes in bundles, and Lucy's pocket handkerchiefs were folded up inside her clean penny and fastened with a silver safety pin. And then they made up the fire with turf and came out and locked the door and hid the key under the door sill. Then away down the hill trotted Lucy and Mrs. Tiggywinkle and the bundles of clothes. All the way down the path, little animals came out of the fern to meet them. The very first that they met were Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny. And she gave them their nice clean clothes, and all the little animals and birds were so very much obliged to dear Mrs. Tiggywinkle. So that at the bottom of the hill, when they came to the stile, there was nothing left to carry except Lucy's one little bundle. Lucy scrambled up the stile with a bundle in her hand, and then she turned to say good night and to thank the washerwoman. But what a very odd thing. Mrs. Tiggywinkle had not waited either for thanks or for the washing bill. 
She was running, running, running up the hill. And where was her white frilled cap and her shawl and her gown and her petticoat? And how small she had grown and how brown and covered with prickles. Why, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle was nothing but a hedgehog. Now some people say that little Lucy had been asleep upon the stile, but then how could she have found three clean pocket hankins and a penny pinned with a silver safety pin? And besides, I have seen the door into the back of the hill called Cat Bells. And besides, I am very well acquainted with dear Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. The end. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jean Deal, and I'm going to be reading um, The Pied Piper of Hamelin by Robert Browning. I, I guess we're going a little bit out of order. Um, so The Pied Piper is our next book. Uh, here, Kate Greenaway illustrates Robert Browning's telling of the tale of the Pied Piper of Hamelin. The legend of the Pied Piper, Pied describes the piper's multicolored clothing, dates back to the Middle Ages. The piper is hired to rid Hamelin of its rats. And when he is not paid for his labors, he leads off the town's children with the very same pipe. The Pied Piper of Hamelin by Robert Browning, illustrated by Kate Greenaway. The Pied Piper of Hamelin. Hamelin towns in Brunswick by famous Hanover City. The river Waser, deep and wide, washes its wall on the southern side. A pleasanter spot you never spied. But when begins my ditty almost 500 years ago, to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was a pity. Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cats and ate the cheeses out of the vat and licked the soup from the cook's own ladles, split open the kegs of salted sprats, made nests inside men's Sunday hats and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in 50 different sharps and flats. 
At last to the, peop the people in a body to the town hall came flocking. Tis clear, cried they, our mayor's a naughty, and as for our corporation, shocking. An hour they sat in council, at length the mayor broke silence. I wish I were a mile hence. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap. Just as he said this, what should hap at the chamber door but a gentle tap? Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? Only a scraping of shoes on the mat? Anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pit-a-pat. Come in, the mayor cried, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure. His queer long coat from heel to head was half of yellow and half of red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin. There was no guessing his kith and kin, and nobody could enough admire the tall man and his quaint attire. He advanced to the council table and, please your honors, said he, I'm able by means of a secret charm to draw all creatures living beneath the sun that creep or swim or fly or run after me so as you never saw. And I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm, the mole and toad and newt and viper, and people call me the Pied Piper. And here they noticed round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe to match with his coat of the selfsame check. And at the scarf's end hung a pipe, and his fingers, they noticed, were ever straying, as if impatient to be playing upon this pipe, as low it dangled, over his vesture so old fangled. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I can rid your town of rats, will you give me a thousand guilders? One, fifty thousand, was the exclamation of the astonished mayor and corporation. Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. Then, like a musical adept, to blow the pipe his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered, you heard as if an army muttered, and the muttering grew to a grumbling, and the grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses the rats came tumbling, brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, grave old plotters, gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed the piper for their lives. From street to street he piped advancing, and step for step they followed, dancing, until they came to the river Waser, wherein all plunged and perished. You should have heard the Hamelin people ringing the bells till they rocked the steeple. Go, cried the mayor, and get long poles, poke out the nests, and block up the holes. Consult with carpenters and builders, and leave in our town not even a trace of the rats. When suddenly, up the face of the piper perked in the marketplace, with a, first if you please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders, the mayor looked blue. So did the corporation, too. Quoth the mayor with a knowing wink, Our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes the vermin sink, And what's dead can't come to life, I think. But as for the guilders, what we spoke of them, As you very well know, was in joke. Besides, our losses have made us thrifty. A thousand guilders. Come, take fifty. The piper's face fell, and he cried, No trifling, I can't wait beside. And folks who put me in a passion may find me pipe after another fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I brook being worse treated than a cook? You threaten us, fellow, do your worst. Blow your pipe there till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe of smooth straight cane. And ere he blew three notes, such sweet soft notes, as yet musicians' cunning never gave the enraptured air. There was a rustling that seemed like a bustling of merry crowds jostling at pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping and little tongues chattering. And like fowls in a farmyard when barley is scattering, out came the children running, 
All the little boys and girls with rosy cheeks and flaxen curls and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping, ran merrily after the wonderful music with shouting and laughter. The mayor was dumb, and the council stood as if they were changed into blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry to the children, merrily skipping by, could only follow with the eye that joyous crowd at the piper's back, but how the mayor was on the rack and the wretched council's bosoms beat as the piper turned from the high street to where the waser rolled its waters right in the way of their sons and daughters. When lo, as they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide as if a cavern was suddenly hollowed and the piper advanced and the children followed. And when all were in to the very last, the door in the mountainside shut fast. Alas, alas, for Hamelin. They wrote the story on a column, and on the great church window painted the same, to make the world acquainted how their children were stolen away. And there it stands to this very day. Well, thank you for listening to, uh, to the Pied Piper of Hamelin. Um, like many old tales, um, this one includes some uh, vocabulary and story elements that can be challenging for modern audiences. And it also contains some enduring themes. Um, the theme of this year's Children's Book Week, uh, Read Now, Read Forever, celebrates the past and the important future of children's literature and the importance of making reading, being read to, or reading to others a part of your life now and in the future. As we celebrate the centennial of Children's Book Week, we celebrate that reach back through history and also forward to the present day to get books into the hands of every child and for every child in our wonderfully diverse nation that is our nation's strength to be able to see themselves in a book. On the one hand, the old tale of the Pied Piper is about a time in a world that no longer exists and the outcome in Robert Browning's telling only one of many versions, is stark and harsh. This tale is also an example of the timeless universal ideas that can be found in stories from the past, and also in the present, just to cite one, the idea that if a person goes back on a promise, they may unexpectedly hurt others whom they care about. Um, many themes of old and new books are shared. For instance, the theme of how a young teen finds resilience to cope with troubles at home, which is a subject I explored in Tiny Infinities. Thank you again for listening. Hello, uh, my name is Sadaha Akilbe, um, Sadaha Akil or Sasa, um, and I am a co-author in a book called I Am the Night Sky and Other Reflections by Muslim American Youth, soon to be published by Shatmas Press. Unfortunately, I don't have it here with me, um, but it will be coming out this June. Um, so today I'm going to be reading Little Red Riding Hood from the Grimm's Animal Stories, published in 1909. Um, Wilhelm and Jacob Grimm collected German folktales as a scholarly endeavor and first published them in 1812 for an adult audience. This collection of 13 tales translated into English for children was illustrated with the fanciful and engaging work of John Ray. Ray's depiction of Little Red Riding Hood's nemesis is particularly satisfying as she watches the wolf tumble into the trough. Little Red Riding Hood. <clears throat> there was once a sweet maid named Little Riding Hood, much beloved by everybody, but most of all by her grandmother who never knew how to make enough of her. Once, she sent her a little riding hood of red velvet, 
and as it was very becoming to her and she never wore anything else, people called her Little Red Riding Hood. One day, her mother said to her, Come, Little Red Riding Hood, here are some cakes and a flask of wine for you to take to your grandmother. She is weak and ill and they will do her good. Make haste and start before it grows hot and walk properly and nicely and don't run or you might fall and break the flask of wine and there would be none left for your grandmother. And when you go into her room, don't forget to say good morning instead of staring about you. I will take care, said Little Red Riding Hood to her mother and gave her hand upon it. Now the grandmother lived far away in the wood, half an hour's walk from the village. And when Little Red Riding Hood had reached the wood, she met the wolf. But as she did not know what a bad sort of animal she was, she did not feel frightened. Good day, Little Red Riding Hood, said he. Thank you kindly, wolf, answered she. Where are you going so early, Little Red Riding Hood? To my grandmother's. What are you carrying under your apron? Cakes and wine we baked yesterday, and my grandmother is very weak and ill, so they will do her good and strengthen her. Where does your grandmother live, Little Red Riding Hood? A quarter of an hour's walk from here. Her house stands beneath the three oaks, and you may know it by the hazel bushes, said Little Red Riding Hood. The wolf thought to himself, that tender young thing would be a delicious morsel, and it would taste better than the old one. I must manage somehow to get both of them. Then he walked by Little Red Riding Hood a little while and said, Little Red Riding Hood, uh, just look at the pretty flowers that are growing all around you. And don't you think you are, and I don't think you are listening to the song of the birds. You are posting along as if you were going to school, and it is so delightful out here in the wood. Little Red Riding Hood glanced around her, and when she saw the sunbeams darting here and there through the trees, and lovely flowers everywhere, she thought to herself, If I were to take a fresh nose ray to Grandmother, she would be very pleased, and it is early in the day so that I shall reach her in plenty of time. And so she ran about in the wood looking for flowers. And as she picked one, she saw a still prettier one, a little farther off. And so she went farther and farther into the wood. But the wolf went straight to the grandmother's house and knocked at the door. Who's there? cried the grandmother. Little Red Riding Hood, he answered. And I have brought you some cake and wine. Please open the door. Lift the latch, cried the grandmother. I am too feeble to get up. So the wolf lifted the latch and the door flew open, and he fell upon the grandmother and ate her up without saying one word. Then he drew on her clothes, put on her cap, lay down in her bed, and drew the curtains. Little Red Riding Hood was all this time running about among the flowers, and when she had gathered as many as she could hold, she, could hold, she remembered her grandmother and set off to go to her. She was surprised to find the door standing open, and when she came inside, she felt very strange and thought to herself, Oh dear, how uncomfortable I feel. And I was so glad this morning to go to my grand grandmother. And when she said, good morning, there was no answer. Then she went up to the bed and drew back the curtains. There lay the grandmother with her cap pulled over her eyes so that she looked very odd. Oh, grandmother, what large ears you have. The better to hear with. Oh, grandmother, what great eyes you have got. The better to see with. Oh, grandmother, what large hands you have got. The better to take hold of you with. But grandmother, what a terrible large mouth you have got. The better to devour you. And, so, and no sooner had the wolf said it than he made one bound from the bed and swallowed up poor Little Red Riding Hood. Then the wolf, having satisfied, satisfied his hunger, lay down again in the bed, went to sleep, and began to snore loudly. The huntsman heard him as he was passing by the house and thought, How the old woman snores. I had better see if there is anything the matter with her. Then he went into the room and walked up to the bed and saw the wolf lying there. At last I find you, you old sinner, he said. I have been looking for you a long time. And he made up his mind that the wolf had swallowed the grandmother whole and that she might yet be saved. So he did not fight fire, but took a pair of shears and began to slit up the wolf's belly. When he made a few snips, Little Red Riding Hood appeared, and after a few more snips, she jumped out and cried, Oh dear, how frightened I have been. It is so dark inside the wolf. And then out came the old grandmother, still living and breathing. But Little Red Riding Hood went and quickly fetched some large stones with which she filled the wolf's belly so that when he, when he, when, so that when he waked up and was going to rush away, the stones were so heavy that he sank down and fell dead. They were all three very pleased. The huntsman took off the wolf's skin and carried it home. The grandmother ate the cakes and drank the wine and held her up her head again. And Little Red Riding Hood said to herself that she would never more stay about in the wood alone, but would mind what her mother had told her. It must also be related how a few days after, when Little Red Riding Hood was again taking cakes to her grandmother, another wolf spoke to her and wanted to tempt her to leave the path. 
but she was on her guard and went straight on her way and told her grandmother how that wolf, how that the wolf had met her and wished her a good day, but had looked so wicked at the, about the eye that she thought if it had not been on the high road, he would have devoured her. Come, said grandmother, we will shut the door so that, I, so that he may not get, get in. Soon after, the wolf came knocking at the door, calling out, Open the door, grandmother. I am Little Red Riding Hood, bringing you cakes. But they remained still and did not open the door. After that, the wolf slunk by the house and got, and got at last upon the roof to wait until Little Red Riding Hood should re return home in the evening. Then he went to spring down on her and devour her in the darkness. But the grandmother dis discovered his plot. Now there, now there stood uh, before the house a great stone trough. And the grandmother said to the child, Little Red Riding Hood, I was boiling sausages yesterday, so take the bucket and carry away the water they were boiled in and pour it in the trough. And Little Red Riding Hood did so until the great trough was quite full. When the smell of sausages reached the nose of the wolf, he snuffed it up and looked around and stretched out his neck so far that he lost balance and began to slip. And he slipped down off the roof straight into the tr great trough and was drowned. Then Little Red Riding Hood went cheerfully home and came to no harm. The end. So the year of this, uh, the theme of this year's uh, book, children's book fest is um, read now, read forever, um, and I believe that that is important because it encourages us to not only look to the past for context, but look to the future for new and bright ideas. And hopefully, we can provide some of those for all readers, including me and yourselves, um, with books to come and books coming that have come. Thank you. The Slant Book is, was first done in 1910 and is pretty amazing. It starts like this. Where Bobby lives, there is a hill, a hill so steep and high, t'would fill the bill for Jack and Jill, their famous act to try. Once Bobby's go-kart broke away, oops, and down this hill it kited, the careless nurse screamed in dismay. But Bobby was delighted. He clapped his hands in a manner rude and laughed with high elation, while close behind the nurse pursued in hopeless consternation. An officer slid off the lid as Bobby hove in sight and bellowed out, You're scorching, kid. I'll run you in, all right. But down the go cart swiftly sped and smashed that cop completely. As he sailed o'er Bobby's head, Bob snipped a button neatly. A funny son of sunny Greece was standing near the curb. Beside his pushcart, wrapped in peace, that naught could well disturb. But all at once he got a shock, the go cart speeding down collided with his fancy stock and littered up the town. The runaway then swerved a bit and snapped a hydrant short, which accident proved quite a hit of rather novel sort. The water spouted in a jet as much as 10 feet high, and all were soaked and nearly choked who chanced to be nearby. A farmer's wife, Miss Aggie Moore, was trudging up the grade, 
a basket full of eggs she bore to barter in the trade. The go-kart and the lady met, informally no doubt, and made a sort of omelette and spread it all about. A painter on a ladder perched was working at his calling. Against its foot the go-kart lurched and sent the fellow sprawling. His pot of paint tumbled down, all right side up, it settled. About a chappy's flaxen crown, oh my, but he was nettled. A German band across the street, its way was slowly wending, which was a moment indiscreet, the way that things were tending. The go-kart struck the bass drum square and passed completely through it. The drummer madly tore his hair and said, why did you do it? Some working men were putting in a heavy glass plate front. The go-kart then came rushing in and did a little stunt. It smashed to bits its crystal pane, two sweating men were bearing, and sped on down the slanting plain and left them mad and swearing. An automobile, big and brown, was chugging up the hill and met the go-kart plunging down with speed that boded ill. At once there rose a noise and din of people in dismay. A sandwich man then butted in and opened up the way. A lad was rushing with a hat some lady had been buying. The go-kart caught and laid him flat and sent that hat back flying. The hat fell out and settled down upon our Bobby's crown head. Say, I'm the swellest kid in town, that precious rascal said. A newsboy next was somehow hit. A, the go-kart, swift and dexterous, contrived to muss him up a bit and fill the air with extras. One copy Bobby neatly scooped and saw this wild display in type so bold it fairly whooped. A go-kart breaks away. Then, as the go-kart speeded by, a bulldog, quite pugnacious, seized on the handle on the fly and clumb with grip tenacious. The go-kart speed was so increased, the dog streamed out behind it, and Bobby turned to pet the beast, which didn't seem to mind it. Perambulating down the street was Miss Lucille O'Grady, the go-kart knocked her off her feet and took on board the lady. You're fair, Bobby said with a shout, one chubby hand extending, but Miss O'Grady tumbled out with shrieks the heavens rending. A herder up the weary grade, a yearling calf was leading. The creature was a stubborn jade. He lunged about unheeding. The go-kart caught between the rope midway between the calf and herder, and both fell in behind the shea with cries of ma and murder. Two chappies, two chappies at the tennis met, were battling fast and hard. The go-kart skidded off the street and shot across the yard. The game was 40 all, but then it didn't end that day. The go-kart dashed into the net and carried it away. On came the go-kart that downed the grade. The town was now behind it and ran into an orchard shade where Providence resigned it. But then it only grazed a tree and set it all a shiver. The ripened fruit fell merrily and likewise Sammy Sliver. Then through a watermelon patch that awful cart descended and split the melons by the batch. The farmer was offended and tried to stop its wild career, which was a silly notion, it passed him promptly to the rear with quite a rapid motion. A picnic party on the green were seated at their lunch. The go-kart dashed upon the scene and threw the happy brunch. Sardines and pickles, ham and cake were jumbled in a mess. Then straight away rose these picnickers and shouted for redress. An artist sketching on the slope, a lively air was humming, and so absorbed was he, he failed to note the go-kart was coming. A crash, the circumambulant air was filled with miscellany, 
and damaged quite beyond repair was Cremet's white Mulvaney. A damsel milked a brindled cow. Out in the pasture green, the birdies sang from bush and bough. All nature was serene. When suddenly a thunderbolt dispelled the sweet illusion, the go-kart gave the twain a jolt and all was wild confusion. Upon a rustic bridge, a chap cast out the bait inviting, and presently he took a nap and dreamed the fish were biting. Then came the go-kart like a gale and rudely him awakened. At first he thought he'd caught a whale, but found he was mistaken. The longest night must have to end, as well as a beginning, and so this cart, you may depend, was bound to cease its spinning. It crashed into a hemlock stump that chanced to block its way, and Bobby made a flying jump and landed in the hay. As I said, I'm Katie Kelly, and I am mad for books. When I was a kid, we had some books hanging around that had belonged to my dad. And I saved my books for my children. And now my granddaughter, when she gets a little bit bigger, will re be reading their books and mine and their great grandfathers. So I think the key is, even when it doesn't make so much sense, like in this poem we just read, um, some of the words are really outdated and nothing we ever use anymore. But it's kind of interesting to find out what words meant at the time and what was popular and how they said things. We never say twas or twaint anymore. But um, anyway, I hope you guys enjoy reading and uh, look for things that are older than you. Hello, my name is Susan Stockdale and I'm the author and illustrator of picture books about nature for young children. Today I will be reading The Emperor's New Clothes from stories by Hans Andersen by Hans Christian Andersen, published in 1911. Hans Christian Andersen's works are probably the most often retold stories in children's literature. In all he wrote 156 tales and stories, seven of which are included here, illustrated with 28 color plates by Edmund Dulac. The Emperor's New Clothes is one of his most delightful. Many years ago, there was an emperor who was so excessively fond of new clothes that he spent all his money on them. He cared nothing about his shoulders, soldiers, nor for the theater, his new clothes, nor for driving in the woods except for the sake of showing off his new clothes. He had a costume for every hour in the day, and instead of saying, as one does about any other king or emperor, he is in his council chamber, here one always said, the emperor is in his dressing room. Life was very gay in the great town where he lived. Hosts of strangers came in to visit every day, and among them, one day, two swindlers. They gave themselves out as weavers and said that they knew how to weave the most beautiful stuffs imaginable. Not only were the colors and patterns unusually fine, but the clothes that were made of the stuffs had the particular quality of becoming invisible to every person who was not fit for that office he held or if he was impossibly dull. Those must be splendid clothes, thought the emperor. By wearing them, I should be able to discover which men in my kingdom are unfitted for their posts. I shall distinguish the wise men from the fools. Yes, I certainly must order some of that stuff to be woven for me. He paid the two swindlers a lot of money in advance so that they might begin their work at once. They did put up two looms and pretended to weave, but they had nothing whatever upon their shuttles. At the outset, they asked for a quantity of the finest silk and the purest gold thread, all of which they put into their own bags, while they worked away at the empty looms far into the night. I should like to know how those weavers are getting on with the stuff, thought the emperor, but he felt a little queer when he reflected that anyone who was stupid or unfit for his post would not be able to see it. 
He certainly thought that he need have no fears for himself, but still he thought he would send somebody else first to see how I was getting on. Everybody in the town knew what wonderful power this stuff possessed, and everyone was anxious to see how stupid his neighbor was. I will send my faithful old minister to the weavers, thought the emperor. He will be best able to see how this stuff looks, for he is a clever man, and no one fulfills his duties better than he does. So the good old minister went into the room where the two swindlers were working at the empty loom. Heaven preserve us, thought the old minister, opening his eyes very wide. Why, I can't see a thing, but he took care not to say so. Both the swindlers begged him to be good enough to, keep, to step a little nearer and asked if he did not think it a good pattern and beautiful coloring. They pointed to the empty loom, and the polar minister stared as hard as he could, but he could not see anything, for of course there was nothing to see. Good heavens, thought he, is it possible that I am a fool? I would never thought so, and nobody must know it. Am I not fit for my post? It will never do to say that I cannot see the stuffs. Well, sir, you don't say anything about this stuff, said the one who was pretending to weave. Oh, it is beautiful, quite charming, said the old minister, looking through his spectacles. This pattern and these colors, I will certainly tell the emperor that this stuff pleases me very much. We are delighted to hear you say so, said the swindlers. And then they named all the colors and described the peculiar pattern. The old minister paid great attention to what they said, so as to be able to repeat it when he got home to the emperor. Then the swindlers went on to demand more money more silk, and more gold to be able to proceed with the weaving. But they put it all into their own pockets. Not a single strand was ever put into the loom, but they went on as before, weaving at the empty loom. The emperor soon sent another faithful official to see how the stuff was getting on, and if it would soon be ready. The same thing happened to him as to the minister. He looked and looked, but as there was only an empty loom, he could see nothing at all. Is not this a beautiful piece of stuff, said both the swindlers, showing and explaining the beautiful pattern and colors which were not there to be seen. I know I am not a fool, thought the man, so it must be that I am unfit for my good post. It is very strange, though. However, one must not let it appear. So he praised the stuff he did not see and assured them of his delight in the beautiful colors and the originality of the design. It is absolutely charming, he said to the emperor. Everybody in the town was talking about this splendid stuff. Now the emperor thought he would like to see it while it was still on the loom. So accompanied by a number of selected courtiers, among whom were the two faithful officials who had already seen the imaginary stuff, he went to visit the crafty impostors who were working away as hard as ever as they could at the empty loom. It is magnificent, said both the honest officials. Only see, your majesty, what design, what colors. And they pointed to the empty loom, for they thought no doubt the others could see the stuff. What, thought the emperor, I see nothing at all. This is terrible. Am I a fool? Am I not fit to be emperor? Why, nothing worse could happen to me. Oh, it is beautiful, said the emperor. It has my highest approval. And he nodded his satisfaction as he gazed at the empty loom. Nothing would induce him to say that he could not see anything. The whole suite gazed and gazed, but saw nothing more than all the others. However, they all exclaimed, exclaimed with his majesty, it is very beautiful. And they advised him to wear a suit made of this wonderful cloth on the occasion of a great procession which was just about to take place. It is magnificent, gorgeous, excellent, went from mouth to mouth. They were all equally delighted with it. The emperor gave each of the rogues an order of knighthood to be worn in their buttonholes and the title of gentlemen weavers. The swindlers sat up the whole night before the day on which the procession was to take place, burning 16 candles so that people might see how anxious they were to get the emperor's new clothes ready. They pretended to take the stuff off the loom. They cut it out in the air with a huge pair of scissors and they stitched away with needles without any thread in them. At last they said, now the emperor's new clothes are ready. The emperor with his grandest courtiers went to them himself and both the swindlers raised one arm in the air as if they were holding something and said, see, these are the trousers. This is the coat, here is the mantle and so on. It is as light as a spider's web. One might think one had nothing on, but that is the very beauty of it. Yes, said all the courtiers, but they could not see anything for there was nothing to see. Will your imperial majesty be graciously pleased to take off your clothes, said the impostors, so that we may put on the new ones along here before the great mirror? The emperor took off all his clothes, and the impostors pretended to give him one article of dress after the other of the new ones, which they pretended to make. They pretended to fasten something around his waist and to tie on something. This was the train, and the emperor turned round and round in front of the mirror. 
How well his majesty looks in the new clothes. How becoming they are, cried all the people round. What a design and what colors. They are the most gorgeous robes. The canopy is waiting outside, which is to be carried over your, ma over your majesty in the procession, said the master of ceremonies. Well, I am quite ready, said the emperor. Don't the clothes fit well? And then he turned round and round again in front of the mirror so that he could seem to be reading, looking at his grand things. The chamberlains who were to carry the trains stooped and pretended to lift it from the ground with both hands, and they walked along their hands in the air, with their hands in the air. They dared not let it appear that they could not see anything. Then the emperor walked along in the procession under the gorgeous canopy, and everybody in the streets and at the windows exclaimed, how beautiful the emperor's new clothes are, what a splendid train, and they fit to perfection. Nobody would let it appear that he could not see, that he could see nothing, for then he would not be fit for his post, or else he was a fool. None of the emperor's clothes had been so successful before. But he has got nothing on, said a little child. Oh, listen to the innocent, said its father. And one person whispered to the other what the child had said. He has nothing on. A child says he has nothing on. But he has nothing on, at last cried all the people. The emperor arrived, for he knew it was true. But he thought, the procession must go on now. So he held himself stiffer than ever. And the chamberlains held up the invisible train. Children's Book Week is important to me because it celebrates the joy of reading and connects readers to new books. Books open up children's imaginations, help them learn about the world, and develop compassion and empathy for others. Enduring books often provide messages that can make them universal and timeless. The I think I can, I think I can refrain in The Little Engine That Could really affected me as a little girl when I read it. It taught me to be persistent and never give up. I credit that persistence with helping me become a published author and illustrator of picture books about nature, like this one here, Bring on the Birds. I hope to excite young children about the wonders of the natural world through my books, rhymes, and paintings. Happy Children's Book Week, everyone. Hello, my name is Carolyn Bennett. I'm a music educator, and I'm this year's teacher in residence at the Library of Congress. Today, I will be singing a few songs from Our Old Nursery Rhymes with original tunes harmonized by Alfred Moffat, published in 1911. 30 nursery rhymes are presented by Alfred Moffat with notated music in this large format book, encouraging singing as well as reading. The softly colored illustrations of children and their surroundings by Henriette Willoughby Lemaire were met with critical acclaim when the book was first published and are still enjoyed today.
Did you notice that Mary had a little lamb sounded a little different than what you may have heard before? That's one of the things I love about this collection of music. Next, I'd like to sing you Pat a Cake, but there's a little clapping pattern that goes along with this song, and I'd like you all to help me out, and if you're listening to this at home, I'd like you to try this out too. The pattern is going to go like this. Try that with me. Pat a cake, pat a cake, baker's man, that I will master as quick as I can. Prick it and nick it and mark it with tea, and there will be plenty for baby and me, for baby and me, for baby and me. And there will be plenty for baby and me. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like you to think about the song Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Can you hear it in your imagination? The tune that you're probably imagining came from France, but in this book, Mr. Moffat uses a different melody. It came from either Spain or England. We're not quite sure. I hope you'll enjoy it. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. When the blazing sun is gone, when he nothing shines upon, then you show your little light. Twinkle, twinkle, all the then the traveler in the dark thanks you for your little spark. He could not see which way to go if you did not twinkle so. In the dark blue sky you keep and often through my curtains peep for you never shut your eye till the sun is Now, I'm going to need a little bit of help on this next song. So I'm going to sing one phrase of music that I want you to learn. When you think you've got it, can you join me in singing? Three blind mice, three blind mice, three blind mice, three blind mice, three blind mice. Very nice. Now, I would like you to keep singing that while I sing the rest of the song. And I think they'll come together and make a really nice harmony together. Ready? Three blind mice, three blind mice, see how they run. They all ran after the farmer's wife, who cut off their tails with a carving knife. Did you ever hear such a tale in your life? song has some hand motions that goes along with it so I'm going to try them out and if you're watching either in the room or at home I challenge you to try them out as well this is the mulberry bush here we go round the mulberry bush the mulberry bush the mulberry bush here we go round the mulberry bush on a cold and frosty morning this is the way we wash our hands, we wash our hands, we wash our hands. This is the way we wash our hands on a cold and frosty morning. This is the way we dry our hands, we dry our hands, we dry our hands. This is the way we dry our hands on a cold and frosty morning. This is the way we clap our hands, we clap our hands, we clap our hands. This is the way we clap our hands on a cold and frosty morning. This is the way we warm our hands, we warm our hands, we warm our hands. This is the way we warm our hands on a cold and frosty morning. 
Now for our last song today, I bet many of you already know the tune to Yankee Doodle. I'd like to sing you the refrain, because this one's just a little different. Yankee Doodle Doodle Doo, Yankee Doodle Dandy, all the lassies are so smart and sweet as sugar candy. I'm going to sing three verses, and it would be lovely if you could join me on the refrain. Is blowing away. Okay. Yankee Doodle came to town upon a little pony. He stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. Yankee Doodle Doodle Doo, Yankee Doodle Dandy. All the lassies are so smart and sweet as sugar candy. Marching in and marching out and marching round the town. Oh, here there comes a regiment with Captain Thomas Brown. Oh, Yankee Doodle Doodle Doo, Yankee Doodle Dandy. All the lassies are so smart and sweet as sugar candy. Yankee Doodle is a tune that comes in mighty handy. The enemy all runs away at Yankee Doodle Dandy. Yankee Doodle Doodle Doo, Yankee Doodle Dandy. All the lassies are so smart and sweet as sugar candy. Hello, my name is Kim Knapp Sawyer. I'm the author of biographies of Anne Frank, Harriet Tubman, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Lucretia Mott. Today, I will be reading The Rocket Book by Peter Newell, published in 1912. Peter Newell's innovative and offbeat approach to bookmaking is on full display here. The Rocket Book has a rocket go off in the basement of an apartment building and travel through each floor leaving chaos in its wake and a hole in the center of each page. The Basement. When Fritz, the janitor's bad kid, went snooping in the basement, he found a rocket snugly hid beneath the window casement. He struck a match with one fell swoop, then on the concrete kneeling, he lit the rock and she, oop, it shot up through the ceiling. First flat. The Steiners on the floor above of breakfast were partaking. Crash came the rocket unannounced and set them all a quaking. It smote a ketchup bottle fair and bang, the thing exploded. And now these people all declare the ketchup flask was loaded. Second flat. Before the fire, old Grandpa Hop dozed in his armchair big, when from a trunk the rocket burst and carried off his wig. It passed so near his ancient head, he roused up with a start and turning to his grandson said, you fellows think you're smart. Third flat. Algernon Brackett, somewhat rash, had blown a monster bubble when oh, there came a blinding flash precipitating trouble. But Algy turned in mild disgust and called to Mama Brackett, say, did you hear that bubble burst? It made an awful racket. Fourth flat. Joe Bud, who'd bought a potted pant, was dousing it with water. He fancied this would make it grow, and Joseph loved to potter. 
Then through the pot, the rocket shot and made the scene look sickly. Well now, said Joe, I never thought that plant would shoot so quickly. Fifth flat. Right here, tis needful to remark that Dick and little son were playing with a Noah's Ark and having loads of fun. When all at once that rocket, stout, up through the ark came blazing, the animals were tossed about and did some stunts amazing. Sixth flat. A burglar on the next floor up, the sideboard was exploring. The family with the brindled pup were still asleep and snoring. Just then, up through the silverware, the rocket thundered flaring. The burglar got a dreadful scare, then out the door went tearing. Seventh flat. Miss Mamie Briggs, with no mean skill, was playing Casey's fling to please her cousin, Amos Gill, who liked that sort of thing. When suddenly the rocket, hot, the old piano jumbled, it stopped that ragtime like a shot, then through the ceiling rumbled. Eighth flat. Up through the next floor on its way, that rocket dread went tearing, where Winkle stood in bathrobe gay, a tepid bath preparing. The tub, it punctured like a shot and made a mighty splashing. The man was rooted to the spot. Then out the door went dashing. Ninth flat. Bob Brooks was puffing very hard, his football to inflate, while round him stood his faithful guard, and they could hardly wait. Then came the rocket, fierce and bright, and through the tumble, football rumbled. You've got a pair of lungs, all right, his staring playmates grumbled. Tenth flat. The family dog, with frenzied mien, was chasing Fluff the Mauser, when poof, the rocket flashed between, and quite astonished Towser. Now, if this dog had wit enough the English tongue to torture, he might have growled such silly stuff as, woo, that cat's a scorcher. Eleventh flat. While Carrie Cook sat with a book, the phonograph played sweetly. Then came the rocket, and it smashed that instrument completely. Fair Carrie promptly turned her head, attracted by the roar. Dear me, I never heard, she said, that record played before. Twelfth flat. Devere was searching for a match to light a cigarette, but failed to find one with dispatch, which threw him in a pet. Just then, the rocket flared up bright before his face and crackled, supplying him the needed light. Thanks, awfully, he cackled. Thirteenth flat. Home from the shop came Maud's new hat, a hat of monstrous size. It almost filled the tiny flat before her ravished eyes, when, shoo! Up through the box so proud, the rocket flared and spluttered. I said that hat was all too loud, her peevish husband muttered. Fourteenth flat. Tom's pap had helped him start his train, and all would have been fine had not the rocket raising cane blocked traffic on the line. It blew the engine into scrap as in a fit of passion. Who would have thought that toy, said Pap, would blow up in such fashion? Fifteenth flat. Orlando Pease, quite at his ease, the morning star was reading. My dear, said he to Mrs. Pease, here's a report worth heeding. The rocket then in wanton sport flashed through the printed pages. The lady gasped, a wild report and swooned by easy stages. Sixteenth flat. Doc Danby was a stupid guy. So, lest he sleep too late, he placed a tattoo clock nearby to wake him at eight. 
But ah, the rocket smote that clock and smashed its way clean through it. You have a fine alarm, said Doc, but say, you overdo it. 17th flat. A penny liner, Abram Stout, was writing a description. The flame shot up, he pounded out, then threw a mild conniption. For through his Flemington there shied a rocket, hot and mystic. I didn't mean to be, he cried, so deuced realistic. 18th flat. Gus Gummer long had set his head upon some strange invention. Be careful, Gus, his good wife said. It might explode, I mention. Just then, the pesky rocket flared and wrecked that Yankee notion. I feared as much, his wife declared, then fainted from emotion. 19th flat. While Bert was on his hobby horse and riding it like mad, the rocket on its fiery course upset the startled lad. The frightened pony plunged a lot like fury playing tag. Whoa, Spot, said Bert. Who would have thought you such a fiery nag? 20th flat. A taxidermist plied his trade upon a walrus's head. It really made him quite afraid to meet its stare so dread, when suddenly the rocket, bright, flared up and then was off. Oh, Minnie, cried the man in fright. Just hear that walrus cough. Top flat. Oh, it was just a splendid flight that rocket's wild career, but to an end it came all right, as you shall straightway hear. It plunged into a can of cream that Billy Bunk was freezing and froze quite stiff, as it would seem, and so subsided, wheezing. Children's Book Week, Read Now, Read Forever, celebrates books that entertain, ones that make us smile or laugh really hard, and some that make us cry. Books that introduce us to characters who become our very best friends. Books that help us imagine the future or remember the past. Many of my own books are about the women and men who stand for social justice and have made a difference in the world. This is a week to celebrate books that inspire. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sasha Dowdy. I work right here in the Library of Congress Young Reader Center. Thank you so much for joining us and hearing authors read the 20 historic children's books now available online in the historic children's selection collection. Thank you for celebrating with us and I hope you enjoy many more programs to come your way. <laughs>